for me, freedom is to have the freedom from something, right? Freedom where the law grants you freedom. You're free from prison. You're free from a bad marriage and an abusive situation. Um, You're free from constraints, right? Societal systemic constraints. But liberation is that work you do internally to be free to. Welcome to Impostrix Podcast, where we affirm the lived experiences of professionals of color who navigate imposter syndrome and racial toxicity at work. The tools that you learn here will help you confidently address racial toxicity at work, put that imposter syndrome to the side, stand in your power, and resist racial gaslighting. I'm your host, Whitney Knox Lee, Black mother to Black boy children, a civil rights attorney, and an anti-racism educator and trainer. If this is your first time listening, welcome. We're glad you're here. Episodes are published every week. Make sure you go back and listen to our past episodes. All right, here we go. I am so excited for this conversation. Yabo and I have been getting to know each other over the past couple of weeks and it's been a pleasure. I, Iabo is somebody that I know will be in my life for a while. Iabo is a recovering attorney. She's a re- facilitator, a community builder. She is a keynote speaker and writer. Basically, she does all the things. And so today we're going to be talking about liberation. We're going to talk about knowing ourselves. We're going to talk about spirituality. Um, and we'll see where the conversation goes. So Iabo, I'm going to kick it to you. If you could introduce yourself, you. telling us the things that are important to you about your identity. I am, my full name is Iabo Onipede. Onipede, if I was saying it like a Nigerian, if I'm saying it for Americans, Onipede. My pronouns are she, her, and I, I do all the things. I love not having a particular title. I love creating workshops for defined communities that help them look at themselves and bond with each other and think of all of the isms. The things I focus on are gender, class, and um, race. And I'm a community builder. I love seeing ourselves in community and trusting each other and loving each other and supporting each other and feeling the freedom and liberation to be our true selves. So that's what I do. I'm the co-director of an organization called Compassionate Atlanta, and that's where I have the most fun. I am myself totally in that community of people and is the best job I ever had. And I love that after 15 years of owning my own law practice and practicing for 20 years, I'm back in a job where I don't have to worry about everything and I can honestly say it's the best job I ever had, including working for myself. And as far as your cultural identities, mm. tell us about that. I am, I consider myself a Yoruba biracial woman who, when I'm in America, I am black, blackity black, right? So my mother was Irish American and Polish Jew. And she met my father, who was Yoruba, in New York City in the 40s. They got married. She lived in Nigeria for 30 umpteen years, as we say. They're both now gone. But I grew up with a white mother and a black father in Lagos, Nigeria. Mm. And I came to America when I was 16 to attend college and law school because you know how Nigerians are. We can't just have one degree. So we have to have multiple degrees. I'm the youngest of three. My older siblings were really smart folks who had paved that path of coming to the States very young and getting on with their lives. And I felt I had to do the same thing. And I think that's why I went into the law part, right? And I just want to say this. It's not the subject for our conversation today, but when I I graduated, um, I think I was 23 from Georgetown Law. Honey, I didn't know my toenail from my nostril. When I look back now at 58, I can say, what the heck was I thinking? And there was something that drew me to the law, the righteousness, the right thing. And then, of course, we get into the law and we find out, no, it's a lot of paper shuffling. It's a very antagonistic, you know, it's very adversarial. It's set up you versus me. 
right? Which was antithetical to my nature. Mm. So I quickly found out I preferred negotiations and transactions more than litigation. And then even with that, I just, it's just, it's like, like Ikea. You know how you enter into Ikea and they make you go through every single department. And unless you know those background shortcuts that, okay, if I go loop, loop, loop around and I cut through here, I'll end up. That's what it was like. And it, it, it killed my soul. So when I say I'm a recovering attorney, I want you to think of like AA. Yeah. Like we need an AA group for lawyers. Yeah. You know, I love what you said around the adversary nature of the law being incongruent with your nature of not always wanting the conflict, you know, is how I, for me, you know, I don't always want the conflict. And then I also have this growing concern or issue or conflict with the idea of working within this legal system that was made to um, keep my people Mm -hmm. um, subservient and Mm -hmm. dominated by Mm -hmm. a dominant class. Um, And I am somebody that believes that we need to dismantle systems from the inside as well as the outside. I just don't know if I'm the person to do it. Perfect. Perfectly stated. And I'm glad you said that, that, you know, we have abolitionists who won't touch it. And it is a process to understand, am I an abolitionist or am I working within the system? And we need all and both. You know, for me, it it was a health thing. You know, I, I had a major life crisis. I went into major depression and I just was not functioning. And so um, to put my scattered brains back in my skull, as I say, I went to seminary Mm -hmm. and I went and got a master's of divinity because I had a very rich spiritual life. And that was the only thing I wanted to do. Education is my way of healing, believe it or not. I'm a good nerd. (laughs) I wish I was. I'm not. (laughs) Particularly how we learn here. I'm not a class person. I'm going to go out and learn experience. My entire last year of law school was internships for credits. You know, like I can't be, I wish I was one of those nerds. Yeah. And and that was part of what I discovered. I'm more academic than in the law firm. And I love to write that experience of law school, lots of work years, life experiences, and then seminary was, I mean, that. I feel like, I mean, I'm not trying to speak anything negative over myself, but like I've died and gone to heaven. Mm. That was my work, right? Now I'm putting it into play. Yeah, well, and the first thing that I thought of when you said I've died and gone to heaven is freedom. Mm. And that's, I think, what we're talking about today is Mm. this idea of liberation. And so, Mm. like, tell me, what does liberation mean to you? And particularly as you endeavor to stop racial harm as a top priority, what does liberation mean? Okay. Um, I, I can't talk about liberation without talking about freedom. And people that work in this area or think, are deep thinkers in this area and write, they have different understandings of words. And I am a wordsmith and I love words. For me, freedom is to have the freedom from something, right? Freedom, where the law grants you freedom, you're free from prison, you're free from a bad marriage and an abusive situation, Um, you're free from constraints, right? Societal systemic constraints. But liberation is that work you do internally to be free to, The etymology of the word liberation is stemmed in nobility and um, where you're nobly born. And that is how we are all born. And these systems and life circumstances change that core identity and reshape who we are. And so once we're free from the, the physical and societal constraints, when we're free from that, we now have the liberation to be these noble, divine 
mm-hmm. beings that we are. Mm-hmm. And also in the etymology of the word liberation is generosity and unrestricted. So it's the, the all of Whitney, like body, soul, and spirit, like you in the cosmos. And I don't mean to get woo-woo, but if we were in the same room, I would be breathing air that has gone through your nostrils and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And so we are more than what we see. We're more than what, than where our skin ends. Right. And so I believe that on multiple planes, I, I, I'm a Christian. I come from a very Christian background, but that's the spirituality of what I'm talking about. So liberation is spiritual work. I think so. I think so. And I've only just maybe in the past couple of years been on this purposefully spiritual journey as it relates to my my work, which is also my passion. So race work, um, criminal legal system work. And I, I'm not one of those people that does well working in, in environments that I'm not like passionate about. Mm -hmm. Um, but also as I've grown to have children and a family and needing to have like boundaries around how I show up and when I show up to work, um, I've found that I need to reconcile, like, I don't know, the, the need that I have to give, to be so generous with my energy, with my time to all of these people with the need that I have to preserve my energy for my family. And so I've really been looking more spiritually for like the underlying foundational like value questions and trying to like have these conversations with my higher power, um, with my spiritual guides to help me work through like how to have the balance that I want to have in my life Mm -hmm. so that I can feel, you know, liberated too exactly what you're saying, to do and live how I want to live. And what I kind of grew up learning about work and professionalism was that we couldn't have that balance. So, you know, I I don't feel like I had a lot of tools. Mm -hmm. Like in law school, there wasn't classes on how to maintain being a lawyer and being happy. Um, And I think that we can apply spiritual tools to figure out where we are in this world, where we want to be, what our presence is, what our role is and is not. Mm -hmm. And so I love, I just like bringing in the spiritual component because it's not something that I think I thought about as a young professional Mm -hmm. um, and how like that part of my development has grown over these last couple of years. Well, let's be frank. Um, number one, as a woman, I, when I came here at 16, growing up in Nigeria, a nascently independent country, there was a lot of physical insecurity. And um, whether it's um, random killings or there is a coup or car accidents because there are no safety standards like this country or armed robbers because the gap between the haves and have nots is so horrible. And I think my parents, their goal was to just get us out of there. Mm -hmm. So they were very much in survival mode, right? And I don't remember having conversations with my mom on things like, what is it to be a woman? Even though she worked and had kids and was her partner's intellectual peer, if not superior, you know, yeah, yeah. they, that my dad was always very clear. I married her cause I like talking to her. She's smart. She's the smartest person. I know my wife is supposed to be smart, not my cook and maid. Right. That was my dad's approach. And my daddy, his approach to being a woman is you can do anything a man can do. And you don't need a man to do anything a man can do. You don't have to ever get married. You don't, you don't have to have children. We will never force you or say you must get married and we'll never ask you for grandchildren. And they never did. Wow. Yet it was my desire 
to be partnered in a heterosexual, stable relationship and to have kids, uh, the white picket fence, the one point, however many kids and the 2.5 dogs or whatever. <laughs> and I, that was just the only fantasy I had about growing up and being an adult. Nobody had helped me explore. And I didn't even know that I had maybe had urges to not be that. Yeah. But that was what I wanted. And when I didn't have that and my world came crashing down because I now had to say, who am I? Oh, I got the law degree from the fancy law school. I got the law firm, I got the big house, I got the husband. The babies ain't coming. Oh, no, the husband's not there anymore. Uh, oh, the house too. Oh, the law. Oh, Lord, who am I? Mm -hmm. When you strip yourself of all of the accoutrements that we were th taught is success. Who are you? And so if you think of all of those accoutrements as freedom from them, it gave me the liberation to figure out what my soul was crying for, which was to build community, to mm -hmm. write. I am a creative person. And here I am trying so hard to fit a square peg in a round hole. I cannot add three plus four. I seriously, I, it's not, I'm not a science linear mathematical thinker. I am a creative. I mm -hmm. write, I problem solve, and I love and nurture people. And those are not millionaire making things. <laughs> Maybe the writing thing if you follow the formulas or whatever, but not the kind of writing I want to do. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I didn't have permission. And I felt so constrained by the chains of society, by the chains of whiteness, by the chains of Americanism, individualism, all of these things. I, and they were so invisible to me, right? so invisible. I did not see it. And so unless I listened to things like this, I would not know that there were alternatives and that I had the right to say, mm, I don't want to do law anymore. I want to go do something else, even though I had the school loans and everything else. Yeah. So how did you come to that realization? I mean, was it you had talked earlier about being in a depression? Crisis. A major life transformative crisis where I was literally ejected out of the chair, put it that way. Yeah. And so in isolation, I sort of found myself and began to really have the opportunity to think. And I don't want, the one thing that's so different for me is that it wasn't a realization that the people around me were bad. My family's always been cool. It's just, I think it's the lure, the, the, the sedation of whiteness. Mm. This is what it is to be successful. As long as you get up every day and do 16 hour days and yay, you're doing it. Oh, you got the house. Okay, you have the nice little car. Okay, the savings account. Okay, the you know, these things that make and then you get there and it's like Yeah. Oh. Well, and I want to break it down just a little bit because you talked about whiteness and that this the sedation of whiteness and I think, you know, some of us, we sometimes have a hard time connecting the dots between like, why does our society or our societal standards, why is that whiteness? You know, because people can listen to what you're saying and say, she's not, why is she bringing race into this? And I really want to distinguish between white people and whiteness. Mm -hmm. White people are the people, the human beings, the sacred holy, divine bodies who just happen to have super pale skin and probably blonde hair and or brunette blonde. And then whiteness is that culture that um, um, promotes that as superior and standard, just like you eloquently said. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, when I said sedate, I wish I had used the word hypnotize because mm -hmm. there's a hypnotic effect that just yeah. rolls you so Coming back to whiteness now. Yeah. When I say whiteness, I'm talking of the culture, the behavior and ways of doing 
um, promoting whiteness as superior. So one way, you know, we all know is the default setting for makeup and band-aids and how um, in, especially in just any um, urban neighborhood, you're go, you know, any major store, you're going to see like a Walgreens or CVS, you're going to see your skin tone stuff and my, probably mine too, on a lower shelf or in a whole different department than the mainstream. Well, don't they have the greater numbers right now? You Well, yeah, okay, fine, right? There's that. But also, I what I respect is that um, white culture, which did not start in America, is a European, mm-hmm. English-speaking European thing because it started with England being the empire of the mm-hmm. world after the Ottomans and after Rome and after all of that. So it was the way of the world. We would be saying the Ottomaness, uh, Ottomaness today if it was still the Ottomans or if it were the Arabs or even Africans, right? There would be resistance that this other person is doing global world domination. Right. That is the piece that is offensive about whiteness culture is that is about domination. It's our way is the right way. And in some of my writing, part of what I'm trying to explore is where did I get the notion that white people thought Africans were barbaric, the word being barbaric and subhuman, right? And I knew this, like it was in the air growing up. Right. And I don't know where the words came from, but it was there. And it is that same when when we say we are, you know, white people think of themselves as we are superior. What I'm saying is that your entire system is built on you are human. You may not think that today if you're white, but the system was built on you are human and that's why you're superior. I'm reading a, um, the love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois right now. And, um, oh, my God, there's one chapter, one place in there where they're talking about mulattoes. And, of course, my ears perked up because right. I've been called that a good couple of times. And how they were not expected to produce. And my mind went to a conversation I had with my dad about why our pets, the dog and the cat, why they couldn't make babies. And why was the dog only humping on the girl dog and not on the cat? Cat. And my dad was like, they're different species. Mm. Can you imagine? Yeah. We, that's like, that's how deep or the first layers of science in this era of enlightenment were that we were such different species. We could be raped. We could be sexually used. We didn't have feelings and we would not produce with them. The gift whiteness brought to the world was this very organized clinical systems. System. So if you know anything about growing up in Lagos, traffic, we're known for traffic. It's called Goslo. And I remember being this kid And the day we started driving on the American side of the road, switch from British side of the road to American side of the road, it was a Sunday. And daddy says, well, let's take a drive so we can be ready for tomorrow. And he kept saying, I want to make sure I go around a roundabout because, you know, roundabouts can be crazy. And so we go around this roundabout and here there's complete bedlam and nobody, you know, people are coming out their cars, banging on the hoods of cars saying, you go, you go. Like nobody knew what to do. And my dad just kept saying, if you follow the rules, you will get there. If you follow the rules, you will get there. There is a system. The white man invented this system. Do it like the white man does, Mm -hmm. and the system will work. So the systems of red lights, roundabouts, yes, I'm very grateful to my white kinfolk for bringing that to the planet, right? And their cars, even though it causes pollutions and I want to be in a car, not on a bicycle on a rainy day like today, but there's contributions and then there's oppressions, right? So 
we this work is about for me it's spiritual because anytime you need to be oppressed like our mother and ancestor Toni Morrison said if I have to kneel for you to feel short baby you the one with the problem not me mm. and it takes spiritual work for you to recognize that you're making me kneel just so right. you can feel tall right well, what's wrong with not being tall anyway right absolutely so that's where all of those pieces come together and if we look at at, at race as culture and cultural imposition and cultural dominance, ways of being, right? Then you begin to see this. I'm not free from these invisible constraints, so I cannot explore any liberation. So, and I want to tie this back to you being everything mom, lawyer, wife, friend, healthy, uh, mentally and physically. And how at my age at 58, I don't know that we're supposed to have it all at the same time. Wow. At the same time. I don't think so. I think it's almost impossible. What it takes to have a baby and not one person can raise a child, not even two. You need that whole village. And we don't have that. That's really affirming. So before we started recording, Yabo and I were talking about exercise and, you know, doing the things to to keep our bodies healthy and feeling good. And I was sharing that I just don't, I don't have the time. I don't have the energy, you know, and um, I go through these little periods, these little fits where I am trying to do all of the things. And I'm in one of those periods right now, actually. I'm trying to do some of the things um, to just kind of, well, okay, let's be honest. I'm going on vacation in a couple of weeks. <laughs> I'm trying to look good. So, um, but I, I love, I mean, yeah, I've never thought about that. I've never thought about just like, maybe this isn't, we're not supposed to do or have, or, you know, ha- yeah. do all of these things at this same time. Yeah. Because I literally don't feel like there's enough hours in the day. There and I, my energy, my energy doesn't even last all day, you know? So like, there's not enough hours in my energy mm-hmm. to do all of these things. And I just want to point something out, girl, if I were going on vacation in two weeks, I, you know, I'm not a skinny person. I can, and I, so I would not be able to do too much in two weeks. Some people can, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> but, and I, I know the feeling I'm a woman, woman, I'm a girly girl. I would want to look, ooh, and so at the minimum, I'm going to go find that swimsuit with the skirt to cover up some stuff, at the minimum, and it's going to be a new one. However, what struck me when you said that is, no, you're supposed to be on vacation resting. Why the hell are you worried about what you look like? Mm. That's what came up in my head, right? So even vacation is about succeeding. Yeah, well, and it's because I feel like, and this is this is in my head. This is nobody telling me this. This is in my head. If I don't feel good or comfortable mm-hmm. on my vacation, mm-hmm. then I won't be able to rest. So, yeah. for example, if I'm laying out on the beach and I don't like how my body looks today, mm-hmm. then I'm going to be anxious mm-hmm. about my body instead of blissing out, listening to the oceans. That's real. This is whiteness again. This is whiteness that, you know, a size 20 is not as attractive in any way, shape or form as a size six. And the goal is to be that size six. Okay, maybe eight. Right. That is whiteness. Right. Right. This is the goal. Right. And this is health. Right. And we all as women, we that is so all day to us and you're going to get to that beach and you're going to see all these men with their pot bellies and they just hanging it out there, rubbing on it like... And they don't even care. And speed on those. I'm like, did you look in the mirror? Well, <laughs> right? I don't want to see all of that. <laughs> Wear a robe to the beach, please. <laughs> <laughs> if they can do it, we can do it, right? It's just, that's the culture. That's So when I talk about culture... And like, look at us, we're talking about body image and um, 
fat shaming and how we yeah. probably are doing it to our own selves. Yeah. But it is a quote unquote racial issue because it's about whiteness and the dominance that has pervaded everything that a size zero is better than a size 20. Mm-hmm. Even though that may be a person with bulimia who may be a week from away from death, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so my my thing that I wanted to say, the metaphor I use is that it's a huge pond, whiteness is, that we're all sw- swimming in. And literally, it's to which degree are you swimming in? And then in this pond, we have orca whales, right, that are the dominators, right? And we have little bitty fish, too. But we're all dealing with this toxicities like uh, bad air. You can't get away from it whether or not you produced it. Right. right. So things like that. Now, it is true that you can overstuff yourself. I've been there multiple times and be so uncomfortable in your body that it is a true discomfort. You know, if your thighs are rubbing and you're trying to do a five mile hike and you're developing welts on your thighs, it is uncomfortable. Right. So the body can be uncomfortable. I'm not knocking that in any way. But, and I'm not even saying change anything. What I'm saying is amp up the awareness. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm saying. And if that's who you are, that is who you are. And it's beautiful. I love it. See, this is why you're going to be in my life for a long time. (laughs) I'm glad that I'm talking to you before vacation. But the thing I want to say, too, that I've discovered in my life is that you can really have it going on in one area. Like many days I feel I have overcome in many areas related to like just being open and being vulnerable and being real. Like I cannot handle fake stuff. Mm -hmm. And I've been fake before. Mm -hmm. Right. So I just had to liberate myself into this. Right. And I feel Basically, I, I mean, I can't remember the last time, watch, by tomorrow something will happen. I can't remember the last time where I had to put on the mask, right? Mm, yeah. But when it comes, and I have, if I if it's a scale of one to a hundred, I probably have 97 on that subject. When it comes to the body stuff, oh no, I'm probably not even in double digits, right? Right, I seven. Do suffer from that, <laughs> right, seven. I do suffer from that and, and it's okay. Mm-hmm. It's okay. Yeah. You know, um, it's we're human and part of being liberated is having the liberation to accept yourself, warts and all yeah. your flaws, your humanity, your frailty, the fact that you need to just be gentle with yourself. And that's where the compassion piece comes in. Yeah. It's not about compassion so much to other people. It's about embodying compassion, fully accepting your own self, because once that energy shifts within you, it just shifts around you. Mm. You know, you just, when you go in places, you either bring that energy with you or you just move to where your energy can be received when you're in that flow. And so compassion for me, you know, it's like that very controversial thing with forgiveness and Christians and turn the other cheek. Compassion for me is to see you in your suffering. And I think that's why I do what I do. I really, I hate to say this on your show. Of course, I identify with Black folk and I feel the suffering and all of that. But I also have a lot of empathy for a white person who is just beginning to wake up and is like, what the heck happened? (laughs) Right? And because my first white person was a beautiful, wonderful, amazing mother. So I didn't grow up with some of the, you know how you you, you can almost be taught as a black person to not trust white people. Yeah. Oh and yeah. I didn't grow up with that. So when I when I started doing this work, I was like, I would want to give up all my privileges voluntarily if I were in that person's shoes. I'd go down kicking and screaming because that's what we do as human beings. But yeah. with me, I'm just able to look at them with compassion and see that, honey, you are not free from the from whiteness. You're still in the chains of whiteness. You need to discard that so you can be liberated to be. Whiteness is such a cheap thrill. 
Because you don't know who you are as a white-bodied human being if your entire identity is about this whiteness crap. You don't know who you are yeah. better than that. So, there, you know, compassion isn't about um, allowing somebody to be nasty to you or slap you and all of that. Or, you know, like my Bible says, turn the other cheek. It means that it's metaphoric and it means other things. It means violence should not, you cannot beget violence with violence. Like, I want you to think of the four elements, water, earth, wind, and fire. You cannot put out a fire with wind. You cannot put out a fire with fire. You know when the firefighters burn areas to prevent a fire? They burn those areas to make the earth show up. Mm-hmm. So that the fire ends, the, the mm-hmm. earth ends up killing the fire, right? Mm-hmm. Fire does not put out fire. Earth puts out fire, water puts out fire. And so turn the other cheek means it's fire, bring sand, bring earth, or bring water to put it out. Because mm-hmm. it's only going to keep escalating, right? Yeah. So compassion may be. How do we dampen this moment now so it doesn't escalate? When people are angry, when they're defensive, then they can't hear you. Why are you wasting your precious gloriousness on somebody who's not even there? Their own humanity is not present to receive yours. And it's an act of dignity and nobility. Remember, uh, liberation is about nobility. It's an act of dignity and nobility to say, Ah, your humanity is not present. Toodles later. That's actually compassionate. Yeah, well, I'll tell my husband because he's one of those who refuses to engage sometimes in argument or whatever it is saying, we'll talk about this tomorrow. And I'm over here like, no, we'll talk about it now. Well, um, you know, you're his wife. He can't ever lose sight of your humanity. (laughs) Come on now. (laughs) I'm talking about strangers and the, uh, things on this racial divide. Yeah. And and I appreciate the fact that your husband is a peace loving person yes. because I'm very peaceful. You see how nice I am? Well, as we begin to wrap it up, um, the one thing that I think maybe we can leave our listeners to is words about how do we find liberation? How do we achieve liberation? And even if it's not in, the whole, like all of Whitney feels liberated. You were talking about how like some parts of us or aspects of our lives, you know? So how do we find or achieve liberation? What, what tips do you have for the first steps? So like, I think freedom and liberation are interwoven. Like, I think you and I are very liberated about a bunch of stuff. We are liberated all the way into, but clearly you and I share... <laughs> the chains and we don't have freedom from, and we're probably very different body shapes, right? I probably like very jealous of you, right? And you probably don't see me as anything but an attractive, you know, and that's what happens, right? It's a distortion, right? Yeah. So there might be some chains here. There's some liberation here, but you keep working the liberation to help you with all the chains. I think humor Like we've just laughed about it. It takes that edge off of it. You see, shame, shame does not thrive when there's um, when there's a community. That's why I'm a community builder. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work going on right now around for men, as black men, especially joy, black joy. And we want to see our men smiling. The work of Carlton McKay, a photographer who is also at the High Museum. His uh, his project is Black Men Smile. So the humanization of Black men, entering into spaces that celebrate your humanity, being intentional about that, right? Um, Resting. Let me tell you, I distinguish between Black women and African-American Black women. Black African-American women literally hold the world on their shoulders. Y'all would do everything, everything. All day, every day, you are, you you just do, 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 do for everybody. And it's like, where, where is your humanity? Where are the soft places? Where is, 
honey, I'm just exhausted and I ain't doing crap today. I'm laying on the sofa, channel surfing, and y'all can feed yourselves. You won't die if you don't even eat for a whole day. You know, <laughs> or I'm just going to go out and and sit in the park and just laugh at the world. Or, you know, I know for a long time I suffered from I'm lazy. Mm. Girl, I be doing everything and I'm lazy. Yeah. It's like I'm hearing this tape in my own head. That's my own stuff. But if black women were not here, everything would fall apart. Everything. I start with, you know, just thinking of Stacey Abrams, thinking of all our elders, our leaders. We've got to stop. Just sit down. Be. Rest. Rest. And then we think about, oh, the angry black woman syndrome. Well, how are you not going to be pissed off at the world where you don't, you don't even have five minutes for yourself? I know I don't. And here you are doing this magical work. (laughs) (laughs) We got to learn to just, you know, like now at my age, I think of what is this life really about? And what am I doing? And what have I done? And you know, I don't have kids, so I don't think of a, like a legacy and da 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 da. I think of it like a flower. Does the flower ask, why am I here? Nah, my DNA says I'm supposed to bloom, smell pretty, drink the water from the rain, enjoy the sunshine from the sun, and that's my job. B. Okay, so I can close us out. Okay. So my my closeout for this wonderful, wonderful podcast would be have a ton of self-compassion and just be, just be, take good care of yourself, rest, play, laugh. I appreciate that. I, I'm definitely going to take this to heart and Yabo and I were laughing about how much stuff I jam packed into today. Um, and like, that's typical, typical me. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I'm definitely leaving the conversation with is figuring out how to allow myself some rest and honor myself really. Cause that feels like an honoring. Yeah. Um, and so what we'd like the listeners to take away from this is, is to rest and be, oh, and right. you know, as an act of self-compassion. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining me, Yabo. And I'm so grateful to be here. I have so much awe and admiration for you and I bless your work. Thank you. And share with us where we can find you. I am yabo.com. I am iyabo.com or compassionateatl.org. And that's a wrap on today's show. If you enjoyed the show today, don't forget to leave me your feedback, write me a review, rate the show, and share with your community. I would love to hear from you. You can find all of my contact information and you can find ways to support the show by donating or purchasing merchandise directly on my website, www.imposterixpodcast.com. Until next time, be validated. It is the night before I'm releasing this episode, and this episode really means a lot to me, and it's coming at the right time. Uh, We're talking about compassion, and we're talking about self-compassion and compassion for others and the role that compassion can play in our search for liberation and our search for freedom. And I think... This isn't often, this isn't something that I think about often. And so having this conversation and really shifting my perspective on what camp- compassion can mean and its role in this liberation movement and in my own personal liberation movement has really been inspiring for me and has really created me, like a, a given me a permission Like now I have a word, I have a word for that goes past like self-care. That's deeper than self-care and that is compassion. So I hope that you all enjoyed this episode um, because I think we have a lot to learn about compassion 
I think we have a lot of tools that we can be using as we work for a more equitable and diverse world, community, workplace, self, as we work to mitigate bias in ourselves. We have a lot of tools. Um, and I think compassion can be one of them. <laughs> 